this morning. I have a lot of idiosyncrasies and quirks. One of those is that I smuggle food. In, in our house and in my office uh, through the years, I hide hostess cupcakes, <laughs> chocolate filled with white icing. I hide Snicker bars, Reese's peanut butter cups, Mallow cups, you name it. And I, and I hide them in my office and all throughout our house. And what happens is I sometimes forget that I've hidden them. My kids one time found in our, it, it was like a half bath, you know, it was off the kitchen. And they found under the vanity a uh, German chocolate cake. <laughs> it was covered. It's not like girls. Forget about things like that. But, you know, and I should also point out I'm, I'm a diabetic. <laughs> Clearly not a good diabetic, but I am one of those. When we reach this time of the morning, it is 11.25, 5 o'clock back there. Do you start to get hungry about now? No? Yeah. You're, you're, I mean, you're, you're, your stomach starts to send you signals. Sometimes it even growls at you. Come on, get to it. I like cinnamon rolls. I love cinnamon rolls. Cinnamon rolls, you know, you take this dough, you unravel it, you just saturate it. Cinnamon, vanilla, always put vanilla, makes everything taste good, unless it's steak. It doesn't work so well in steak. <laughs> Roll it up, you put it in the oven, it just cooks up and you pull it out, the whole house is just filled with the aromatic freshness of cinnamon rolls. And then you take a fork and you start heading for your mouth with that first bite. Are you with me? Your mouth begins to salivate. That's exactly right. And your taste buds are gathering party favors because they're about to throw a dance. The food enters. Boom! And then it begins to slide down your throat, leaving this trail of culinary ecstasy. <laughs> and <laughs> falls into your stomach. And before you can lick your lips, your stomach is transmitting to your brain, send more. <laughs> Are you with me? I, as it so happens, I have cinnamon rolls. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's stuck there because of the icing. These are from Panera Bread. See, the kids know that. 
they are leaders. And they're hungry. You're what? Hey, this is good stuff, isn't it? I, I might just spend the rest of our time eating this pastiche. This is a good idea. What this is? This is how sermon should start. The problem is to get my mouth to stop salivating so I can talk. Nobody else wants that? This is interesting. See, I, what I wish, I have to interrupt you. You guys go ahead and help yourself to sticky buns. Cinnamon rolls. I wish I could get into all your minds right now. You know what this is called? Evangelism. This is called evangelism. We're supposed to live our lives in such a way that we make people hungry and thirsty for the Word of God. I didn't have to cram sticky buns. I didn't have to cram cinnamon rolls down your throat, did I? It's had to make you hungry for it. Evangelism is when we make people hungry for the gospel. But we can't make people hungry for something for which we're not hungry. We can't make them want something that we're not really craving. So, and what's interesting, I mean, you have to admit, and by the way, you're far more godly than first service. Well, there were a few takers in first service, but when we were done, I had a mountain of cinnamon rolls still sitting here. Look what's left. Nothing! He says, I got gypped. See, some of you are sitting there and you're thinking, who is this moron? <laughs> Does he think he's going to make me go up there and eat cinnamon rolls in church? <laughs> hey, go away. <laughs> I have to preach now. Okay, after church, you guys can come and get more. But not now. I, I need to say something. Just because we live our lives in such a way that it makes people hungry, it doesn't mean they're going to eat. Just because we live in a way that, that our hearts long for the Lord, others may see it, but they won't all respond. Wish they would. My goodness. We can't even get people in the church to always respond. But that's our job. That is our job. To live our lives in such a way that people hunger and thirst. Hey, we long all the time. People are always longing. People are longing for more. You know, more. I want more money, more cars. I want more education, more activity, more exercise. People want more attention. We long for significance. We long to make a difference. We long to be noticed. We long. We long. We long. And sometimes, it's not so much that we long for more as we just long for what somebody else has. And we long and we long and we're often left empty. We've got nothing. We fill it up. Now, if statistics are accurate, and I think they are, there's a bunch of us right here in this sanctuary that are engaged in pornography. Yeah, let's just get down to dirty right away. You're engaged in pornography. Some of you have addictions you're hiding. Some of you may be engaged in an affair that nobody knows about. Some of you are engaged in sex before marriage. 
Some of you are engaged in all kinds of things that you know is not right. But you long. You long. And you keep coming up empty. We sit at broken bars, with glasses that seem full, but we're left empty. We're left with this sediment of guilt and loneliness. And yet we look. C.S. Lewis, theologian, philosopher, writer. I want you to look at what he has to say. He says, creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. A baby feels hunger. Well, there's such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there's such a thing as water. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably, earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. You see, the reality is we were not made simply for this world. We were made for God. And until we hunger and thirst after Him, we're going to come up empty every single time. We're going to look at that beatitude this morning, Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They will be satisfied. Father, as we as we look at this particular verse, and I know we can't exhaust it in the short time we have, but I'm certainly not relying on any ability I have to teach. We're relying on your spirit to teach us. To open up our hearts and to give us understanding. Lord, we are all at a variety of places in our walk with you, and some are struggling here this morning. Some sit here and we we sang with the worship. But some are empty. Lord, create within us a hunger. A hunger that is so great that we find that satisfaction in you. And then, Lord, may we live our lives in such a way that we cause others to hunger and to thirst. <coughs> Teach us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I want to give you two principles I want you to take home today. Number one, our appetites reflect our maturity. Appetites reflect our maturity. Now understand this. We need to have this hungering for righteousness. And if there is a hungering, it can be satisfied. It begins to show up and our appetites begin to reflect the level of our spiritual maturity. How many of you have ever had kids? How many of you have ever been a kid? Our kids are, Queenie and I have, have two kids. Uh, our son is named David, I call him Augie. Remember the old cartoon? Augie, my son, my son. <laughs> Some of you that are young, you say, what is this? You're thinking, let's get this guy signed up for counseling right now. <laughs> and uh, our daughter, she's my little girl. She's 43. She's still my little girl. I call her punk, punky, little apple. Um, when, they were, when they were wee little, we fed them baby food. You know the stuff that comes in a jar? It is vile and disgusting. You wonder why when you take the spoon and head for their mouth, they're like, mm. would you eat that? The bananas were pretty good, but beyond that, but then they, you, 
their appetites begin to change, they eat it, they're, they're little, they have no choice, it's eat or die. When I was a kid, I could not stand salad. He did salad. I love salad now. Our, our tastes change as we mature. I, I, uh, when I was in high school, I worked at McDonald's. And I'm going to date myself here. I worked at McDonald's when the Big Mac was introduced. That's pathetic. <laughs> and when I worked at Mickey D's, our pay was a dollar an hour and all you could eat. I could eat. <laughs> a typical meal for me, two Big Macs, two cheeseburgers, three hamburgers, two large fries, a milkshake, and a large Coke. If I happened to be hungry, I could eat a lot more. And I was skinnier than thread. I, I ran cross country, I wrestled, and played baseball. So my metabolism was whoa. Anything that entered my body, my metabolism, metabolism grabbed it and beat it to smithereens, never gained an ounce. I was known for my appetite in school. I do not want to be known for my appetite. I want to be known for my appetite for God. I want there to be a level of spiritual maturity in my life that reflects a hungering after God. Now I'd like to tell you that I always reflect that, but I don't. I'm as human as you are. And it requires intentionality to do that. Anybody here ever been on a diet? They are straight from Satan. <laughs> and then they tell you, well, you shouldn't diet. You should develop a lifestyle. <laughs> you think I'm going to spend the rest of my life eating carrots? But now, those of you that are smart, you say, well, yeah, that is right. And see, we do the same thing with the Lord. It's not like we should go on some spiritual rampage. We want a lifestyle that causes us to hunger and thirst after God. I, I, uh, I actually have been fairly good about not eating this kind of stuff. Queenie, is that right? Recently. <laughs> she said recently. Okay, I'll give you that. And so what I've noted is that because I've been better about this, when I do eat something sugary like this, whoa, it just sort of, it overwhelms me because my body says, what are you doing? Here's a little gut check for you. Because you know that you, we tend to, if sin is over here, we like to get right on the edge. Right on the edge. You say, well, I haven't fallen, but boy, we're teetering. If you're living in a life where you're living on the edge and you're teetering and you don't notice it, you should be bothered. Because if you're hungering and thirsting after God and you get near the edge, there ought to be something that rushes through your system and says, whoa, this is not who you are now. Our maturity our appetites should reflect our maturity, that we are actually growing in grace. We're learning more about the Lord. See, here's what happens. The person that is not hungering after God starts demanding a lot more from people. I, mean, I remember, I, I became pastor of a church, and unbeknownst to me in this particular church, there were uh, some very serious financial problems. And I found out after I got there. Uh, we were about $200,000 in the hole in day-to-day -day operation, which is not a good place to be. And I remember sitting around the table with a finance team, 
And we've been sitting there hashing this out for like two hours. And the truth of the matter is, there were people sitting around the table that could have written checks and eliminated the dead boom right there. But they weren't going to do that. And so we came to a point, and one of the guys said to me, he said, uh, well, Pastor, what do you think we should do? I, I've been there about three months. I said, well, he said, I don't think we got here overnight. We're probably not going to get out of overnight. And I think that we really need to seek God. We need to do some serious praying and say, Lord, how do you want to navigate us through these waters? This is what happens. And I, I, I'm not exaggerating. He looked at me and his head went. And then he raised it and he looked at me and he said, well, that's really nice, Pastor, but what are you going to do? That was a great lesson for me. Because I realized he expected more from me than he did God. That's what happens to us subtly. When we are not pursuing the Lord, we start expecting more from each other than we do God. We start looking to each other for the answer instead of God. We start depending solely on one another. Now don't misunderstand. There is an interdependence that God builds among us. He does want us to lean on each other in a healthy manner, but not above Him. And then what happens is, as we start to lean on one another and look to each other for more solutions, we start fighting about stuff that doesn't matter. Now, it's like I told First Service. When I bring up a problem that exists in a church, it's a given it doesn't exist here. <laughs> We are flawless and or perfect. So anything I mention is about somebody else, and you can take it out and pray for those other people. But I'm going to tell you that there are churches around this country that have split because they couldn't agree on the color of the carpet or the color of the paint on the wall. Or if they say they have pews or chairs. Or how loud the music is. Or what songs they sang. These are problems all over. And while they're fussing about that, people are dying and going to hell all around them. How many here don't like Chick-fil-A? Yeah. Oh, a lot of people. It was the color of the walls in their restaurant. Anybody know? Of course you don't. You went in for a chicken sandwich. So why do churches get all hung up on the color of their walls and forget why people walked in their door? They didn't come in for the color of our walls. They thought they might find God. Are we mature enough to recognize that? Do we know that? Or are we so hungry for what we want that we forget what we need? Or what those around us need? Blessed are they that hunger. The sense of this text in the Greek is blessed are they that are hungry, that are thirsty. It is ongoing. It doesn't stop. I don't want to get to the point his love endures how long his mercies endure every day his mercies are brand new is that not mind blowing I often tell people I will spend all of eternity learning what God already knows and never catch up Man, there is room for my appetite to grow. You see what I'm saying? And my appetite will reflect my maturity. Am I growing in grace? Am I learning about Him? As a deer pants for the water, so my soul 
hands for thee, O Lord. David said, Your word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against you. I want to know you. I want to pursue you. Think about Ezekiel, who ate the scroll. Jeremiah, who said, I found your word and I ate it.
the inspiration for a song some of you that are older will remember. I only have eyes for you. <laughs> hey, I did not want to eat this. And I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, the rule of thumb is you can't offend, offend the nationals. I'm thinking, what am I going to do? Because this, if I eat it, is going to come back. My Peruvian buddy next to me, Miguel, he looks and he says, oh, that looks really good. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Tom, if ever you needed to be generous, this is the moment. <laughs> Slid my bowl over. Miguel, I, I, I can't take from you. I want you to eat this. My friend and buddy. And he snarked that up like it was a hostess cupcake. Now, what was the problem? The problem was not in the soup. My taste buds had not been garnered to eat that stuff. His were. It is a sad thing, folks, when people walk into the church every day and our taste buds, our appetite, has not been garnered for righteousness. In fact, you know, a lot of times we sit in church and we're more focused about what's going to happen after the service than what's happening right at that moment. Not you. Not you. <laughs> we think about what we're going to have for dinner, where we're going to go. Thinking about Super Bowl. We think, are they really having a reception for him when the Super Bowl kicks off? What are they thinking? I'll say hi to him next week. Well, the wrong teams are even playing tonight, so what's the difference? We think about all kinds of stuff because we have not nurtured our appetite. Our appetite reflects our maturity, and our maturity shows up because it reflects the righteousness in our life. Uh, Sir Ernest Shackle, Shackleford, I think his name was. So he was going on, a, on, a, on an expedition to the South Pole. So he starts out, he was actually going 127 days, never made it. Started out with four ponies, they all died. They were down to very little food. They had to turn around, they're heading back. And he writes in his journal that all they thought about was food. Gourmet meals, huge feasts. That's the only thing that kept them going. They had dysentery. They didn't even know if they were going to make it, thought they were going to die. All they could think about was food. That which they knew would keep them alive. Part of our challenge as men and women is when we hit tough times, we are so focused on ourselves that we forget about God. We forget about the one who can really satisfy, the one who can heal, the one who can help. We are so self-consumed. I don't want to be self-consumed. I want God's righteousness to be in what I'm doing. Now let me differentiate between holiness and righteousness. Holiness, would you agree with me that holiness cannot be separated from God? Wherever God is, holiness resides. Would you agree? So if I want to be holy, it's not going to be by virtue of anything that I do. If I want to be holy, I have to make sure that He resides in me because where He resides, that's where holiness resides. So that means that I'm not going to keep anything back from Him. It is a total and complete surrender. The Apostle Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15, I die how often? Daily. A complete and total surrender that occurs every single day that keeps me holy. But being holy is not simply a state in which we want to reside, but out of the holiness come righteousness or right choices. I want what I do to reflect who I am. Now if you're like me, that doesn't always happen. I've fallen on my face more times than I can. Man, 
imagine, who would like to admit. My humanity keeps cropping up and slapping me in the face. And yet God comes back. He says, Tom, I want you. And I am floored by it. You know what amazes me? That God lets me stand before you and preach the word. Who am I? Who am I? Who are we? As the Almighty God said, I will come and die for you. I will humiliate myself because I love you that much. I love Queenie back there. And do you know what I want? I want her to want me. God belongs for us to want him. He looked out over the city that he loved. He saw Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Stoning the prophets and killing those who I've sent to you. How often would I have gathered you together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. He longs for us. Do we long for him? Our spiritual development is sometimes stunted because we want theological fast food. Burger King food, have it your way. There's a cost to serving the Lord. There is. It's not easy peasy. There's a cost. Now I'm going to tell you something, as I said when I started out. I don't come here to play games. And I don't believe that you come here to play games. But it's easy for complacency to settle in on any of us and all of us. And what we're going to do is pray that the Lord will say, Thomas is how you need to change. And you insert your own name in there. How do you need to change? Does your appetite reflect your maturity or your immaturity? Does your maturity reflect his righteousness? When we're finished here, we're going to be talking to each other, and uh, you know what it's like when you talk to people? You know what they ate. And if they had onions, there it is. <laughs> if they had coffee, there it is. And you can't hide garlic. Before first service, Queenie comes into my office. I go over and talk to her, and she puts her purse down, reaches in her purse, hands me a breath mint. I said, is it that bad? She said, you smell sick. She loves me. The scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we are the aroma of Christ. Can people tell? Can they tell? In, in a couple of weeks, we're going to talk more about that particular dynamic. Next week, we're going to start a series called Broken. Because we're all broken. And we're going to go through some scriptures. I think we're going to look at some passages that you have never seen in a matter in which you will see them. Archaeology, culture, languages reveal so much. And uh, we're going to look at some things about what God expects of us. But I want us to be hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Matthew 6.33, do you know what it says? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. We 
we, we instinctively go for all the other things before his righteousness. We're going to pursue him. We're going to pursue him. Would you stand with me? Lord, I stand before a wonderful group of people, men and women, all of us, for whom you died. And you long for us. You long for those moments that we would give you our undivided attention. Lord, I pray you'll help us. Not just this next year, but throughout our history, moving forward. That we will pursue you with passion and fervency. That we will humble ourselves. We will allow you to mold us break us in any manner in which we need to be broken. We desire to be men and women that please you, that honor you. And Lord, we desire to live our lives in a way that causes people to be hungry. That in fact would drain us from everything we have and are so that you can keep refilling us pouring yourself through us for your glory. May your name be high and lifted.